applicates and eukaryotes that has 11 subunits. Could you predict what would be the case in this, uh, the eukaryotic helicase, for example, with 11 subunits? Would there be one or two devoted to, to, to regulate the process? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a very good question. Actually, as you know, and I think you all as biologists know, it's actually difficult to make predictions in biology, but uh, it is not physics, but um, I can tell you that uh, we have been studying other ring motors, uh, uh, the one that actually is in involved in segregating the DNA between the mother cells, uh, the, between the sister cells, or between the mother cell and the pre-spore, and also a ring ATPase that whose function is to unfold proteins. And in all those cases, there is breaking of symmetry. One or two of the subunits actually perform, even though they are identical to begin with, one or two of those subunits perform a different function than the others. For example, in the case of the unfoldase, which unfolds proteins, two of the subunits of the six subunits don't even bind ATP. Don't even bind ATP. That's the, the breaking of symmetry is quite dramatic in that case. And so it seems, to, it seems that actually it's quite general among these ring ATPases, the breaking of symmetry, in order to perform, to perform a division of labor among the different subunits. The next question, Dr. Mario Surita in the back. Um, so my question is kind of general. Uh, do you think it's possible to perform similar experiments, but instead of use uh, naked DNA, to use uh, DNA that is assembled in nucleosomes? And see how far, for example, I think it's going to be interesting just to see how flexible is the DNA in these conditions. For it is assembled with nucleos, uh, nucleosomes. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, in 2009, we performed a series of experiments where we wanted to see how promiscuous the motor is in terms of translocating a polymer, let's say. And so, for example, we eliminated the charges in the DNA, and we discovered the importance of making a 10 base pair contact with the phosphate in those experiments. We also put pieces of single-stranded DNA inside the double-stranded DNA and look at what happened to the motor when it arrived at the single-stranded DNA, and we found that the DNA manages to package the single-stranded DNA. Then we, in desperation, we said, okay, let's put a piece of polyethylene glycol joining two pieces of DNA, and much to our surprise, the motor was able to actually package the polyethylene glycol as well. So there is one part of the motor which actually makes quite non-specific, steric contact, the paddles that actually power the DNA, that internalize the DNA, are probably of uh, steric and non-specific uh, nature, and therefore, no matter what you put there, as long as it is a polymer, it will actually be internalized. In the case of the nucleosome that you ask, it's possible that the nucleosome is too bulky to enter the opening in the motor, in which case it will actually probably bump the nucleosome because this motor is so strong that, now why is it so strong? It's strong because at the end of packaging, we measure that the DNA is at a pressure of 30 atmospheres. 30 atmospheres of pressure. That's six times the pressure of a bottle of champagne, the cork in a bottle of champagne. So when you open a bottle of champagne, the cork comes out at a pressure of five atmospheres. And at the end of packaging, the DNA ends up at the fourth, at the pressure of six times that pressure of the bottle of champagne. Why? What for? Nothing happens in nature fortuitously. And what happens is that the motor then, when it has to infect a new the virus, when it has to infect a new bacterium, uses that pressure to inject the DNA inside the new bacterium and internalize the DNA. So it has to be a very powerful motor. So I predict that the if we would put the nucleosome, the nucleosome would be just bumped like a wire stripper. The motor would function as a wire stripper and bump the nucleosome. The next question is from Dr. Van der Leij Bairniato. Okay, well, thank you for the nice presentation. I have two questions, but uh, it's, it's from physicist to biologist. Uh, the first one is, you're dealing now with a molecule by molecule type of mechanism. So my first question is not uh, what's going right, but what, how can that be wrong? So how many mistakes the system tolerates? 
if I go molecule by molecule, some goes wrong. And how the system tolerates that? It must tolerate quite well because uh, otherwise it will be all wrong, right? So what is the tolerance of mistakes that uh, those m tiny molecular models allow us to, to have? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, in fact, I think that we have pondered ourselves that question. Uh, how robust is the process? And what we have found is that for certain molecular motors, the system can, uh, can be very picky, like in the case of this bacteriophage, where as soon as you uh, prevent one of the subunits to work, the whole motor stops, because it has to package in a very regulated and coordinated manner in order to have enough um, processivity to generate forces up to 30 atmospheres. But there are other motors, like for example, the ones that segregate the DNA between two daughter cells, where if they were to be that finicky, that as soon as it, one of the subunits gets, gets inactivated, then the motor stops, then a lot of times that would lead to the death of the cell. See, a, when a bacteriophage infects a cell, you end up producing 80 copies to 100 copies of the bacteriophage. If something goes wrong with one, you still have other 99 phages that would go well. But in the other case, in the case where it is actually uh, the separation between the DNA of between one daughter cell and the other daughter cell, if that separation stops, the whole thing is dead. So these motors are a lot more permissible you can inactivate one subunit and they continue working. You can inactivate a second subunit and they continue working. You can inactivate even a third subunit and they don't like it, but they continue working. So that seems to indicate that they are trying to actually provide robustness and resilience to the process because it's a, cross, it's a checkpoint that is either death or life for the cell in this case. And uh, as a physicist, always we speak about motors. We think about... Uh, thermo engines. We put energy, we get energy. How efficient is this? Is anybody looking to that? Yes. We is life a very more efficient? Or yes, less we, efficient? we have looked into the efficiency of these motors. And this one, for example, the surprising thing is that these motors are extremely efficient. And there is a lot of interesting physics there, for those of you who are physicists, because that we still don't understand. You know, thermodynamics was developed in the 19th century to describe the behavior of thermal e engines. Now we are talking about chemical engines here that are actually working at the, at, the, at the thermal bath temperature, at KT energies. And these, these motors function as open systems that can actually absorb heat from the surroundings and use that heat temporarily and then pay it back afterwards, right, in the form of ATP hydrolysis. That doesn't happen with a macroscopic engine because we don't say, well, if I turn on the car, Oh, today is summer, so my car is going to be more efficient, or today is winter, it's going to be less efficient because my car cannot absorb energy from the surroundings. We never think of that because in the macroscopic thermodynamics and microscopic um, mechanics, that is impossible. The energy of the engine is much larger than the energy of the surroundings. But these tiny machines are so small that their energies are comparable to the energies of the surroundings. And as a result of that, they have enormous uh, efficiencies. We've calculated for this motor that the efficiency of the motor is 70%. And for some other motors, the uh, energy efficiency has been uh, calculated to be up to 85%. So there is a lot of lessons to be learned about how these tiny motors actually use, employ, and transfer energy. <laughs>